Wake up! Wake up! 起来了，快起来了 ！The nationalists are here. 国民党军队来了，起来，快点呐、啊、！On a cold December night in 1948, in a small village in central China, a man named Chen Hongjun is awoken by his parents. <sighs> he's still so sleepy, and he's really confused what what his parents are saying. But as soon as his parents tell him that the nationalist soldiers are here, he freaks out. Oh no! Oh no! Chen Hongjun knows a fight is about to start, and they don't want to get caught in the crossfire. So he quickly takes his one-year-old son, grabs his wife and his parents, and hurriedly leaves home. But because he's in such a hurry to leave home, he forgets to take his coat. They meet up with some other villagers on the village outskirts and find a place to hide, shivering in the cold night, as they find a way to stay away from the battle, to escape the battle, to stay warm and stay together, and to survive. And at this point in time, Chen Hongjun is seriously regretting not bringing his coat because he's freezing right now. They hide for days. Before the food that they bring with them begins to run dry, Chen Hongjun decides to make the brave decision to sneak back to the village to get some food, some supplies, and of course his large coat. When he arrives back to his village, he sees the village is teeming with soldiers, who have all occupied the homes of the escaped villagers. When he gets back to his own home, though. He quickly realizes his home is more heavily guarded, in particular, than the other homes. At that time, Chen Hongjun had no clue why his place was heavily guarded than the rest. He didn't know what was going on, but later on he understood that his home had become the temporary home of a very powerful, top-ranking nationalist army general. G'day, everyone. I'm your host Stephen, and welcome to another episode of the Bamboo History Podcast. For those of you who don't know, the Bamboo History Podcast is a podcast on Chinese and East Asian history. If you like this type of content, please subscribe to my podcast right now and follow my Instagram as well at Bamboo History Podcast, where you'll find teasers for my episodes, visual content, and also extra history content that aren't podcast episodes. So go check it out. Last week we talked about the Liaoshan Campaign, the first of the three decisive campaigns of the Chinese Civil War that allowed the Chinese Communist Party to defeat the Nationalists and establish the People's Republic of China. Today's episode, we're going to talk about the second and the bloodiest campaign of the three, one that was fought tooth and nail by both sides in the Chinese Civil War. Today is part two of the three-part Chinese Civil War series, and today we will be talking about the Huaihai Campaign. So yeah, let's just get straight into it. To help you all understand the movements of the armies in this campaign, I have drawn a simple diagram for you to use as a reference, which will be posted on my Instagram. Before we begin the campaign, though, let's start off with a bit of background. The Huaihai Campaign, Huaihai spelt H-U-A-I-H-A-I, was fought in the Central China Plains and the East China region, north of the Huai River. Huai spelt H-U-A-I. The battlegrounds were primarily around the cities of Xuzhou, spelt X-U-Z-H-O-U, and Bengbu, spelt B-E-N-G-B-U. The area around Xuzhou and Bengbu was an important gateway to the Yangtze Changjiang River Delta region in southern China. More importantly, it was a gateway to the city of Nanjing N A N J I N G. For those of you who don't know, at that point in time, Nanjing was the capital of China, and also the headquarters of the nationalist Kuomintang government. 
From a strategic perspective, it was important for the Chinese communists, led under Mao Zedong, M-A-O-Z-E-D-O-N-G, to take full control of the Xuzhou and Bengbu areas and create an opening for them to strike at the heart of the nationalist government in Nanjing. It was equally important then for the nationalists, led by Jiang Jieshi, J-I-A-N-G, J-I-E-S-H-I, to defend this region at all costs. And as a side note, Jiang Jieshi is also known in English as Chiang Kai-shek, but I'll refer to him as Jiang Jieshi, the Mandarin Chinese pronunciation. Okay, so we know the stakes are high for both the communists and the nationalists in the prelude to this campaign. Now, prior to the start of the Huaihai campaign, the communists had already taken control of all the territories north of the Xuzhou Bengbu region, as well as large parts of the countryside within the Xuzhou Bengbu region. The nationalists, on the other hand, by 1948, had only control of the major urban centres in that area, including their headquarters at Xuzhou. Now, before we get into the campaign, let's do a face-off of the two sides fighting in the Huaihai campaign. Let's start off with the Chinese communists. So the communist soldiers were known and still known as the People's Liberation Army, or PLA for short, Jun. And the two major communist forces that Mao Zedong commanded to enter the battle were the PLA 2nd Field Army from Central China and the PLA 3rd Field Army from East China. The PLA 2nd Field Army was led by Liu Bocheng, spelt L-I-U-B-O-C-H-E-N-G, and Deng Xiaoping, D-E-N-G-X-I-A-O-P-I-N-G. Deng Xiaoping later became the leader of the People's Republic of China, and he was the one instrumental in leading China's open market reforms in the 1980s. The PLA Third Field Army was led by Chen Yi, spelt C-H-E-N, Yi, and Su Yu, S U Y U. Whilst Chen Yi was the official leader of the PLA Third Field Army, Su Yu was the de facto commander, because he was a tactical genius, and he was rated alongside Lin Biao as the PLA's best military commander and strategist. In total, the number of communist troops numbered around six hundred thousand with a bit of artillery support, but they had no air support whatsoever. Now, let's look at the nationalist Kuomintang troops. Their troops were mainly concentrated around Xuzhou and the surrounding areas. The nationalists in Xuzhou were led by field commander Liu Zhi, L-I-U-Z-H-I, and he was later on joined by Du Yuming, spelt D-U, Y-U-M-I-N-G, who was the deputy commander. Du Yuming had actually been flown in from northeast China, where he had been commanding nationalist troops in the Liaoshan campaign before it ended in defeat. He was called back by Jiang Jieshi because Du Yuming was a capable commander, and he had been specially flown in because Liu Zhi, the actual field commander, was very weak and ineffective. In fact, one of his subordinates, a general named Qiu Qingquan, Q-I-U-Q-I-N-G-Q-U-A-N, had actually said something along the lines of this. Ahem. I cannot believe it, but we're letting a pig command us into battle, calling his own boss a pig. So, that was the type of respect that was given to Liu Zhi. The nationalist armies consisted of the 2nd Army, the 6th Army, the 7th Army, the 13th Army, and the 16th Army. The 12th Army later on joined the battle as reinforcements from central China. So in total, all of these nationalist troops totaled around 800,000, in contrast with 600,000 communist troops. The strength of the nationalists was their manpower, and also their equipment. They were equipped with the best weapons and artillery supplied by the US and also other machinery like tanks. They also had air support, which is very important, as you know. 
So in contrast, the communists weren't that well equipped. They had really poor quality guns, artillery, and had no air support whatsoever. But what they did have was a strong support network of local militia, as well as the support of the local civilians in the Xuzhou Fengbu area, who helped provide communist soldiers with supplies. Now, finally, let's get into the Huaihai campaign. So the Huaihai campaign officially began on the 6th of November 1948. The nationalist strategy was to defend their main city of Xuzhou, and to do so, Commander Liu Zhi ordered all of the nationalist armies in the surrounding areas to abandon the areas they had controlled and retreat back to Xuzhou. Unbeknownst to them, however, the PLA 2nd Field Army and the PLA 3rd Field Army, under orders from Mao Zedong, and the communist leadership group, had actually arrived already in the area, and were ready to take down the retreating nationalist soldiers. Their first target was the nationalist 7th army, who had come from the east in Haizhou and was retreating west to Xuzhou. The 7th army was very slow in retreating back to Xuzhou. Firstly, it took them days to actually leave the area that they had been controlling. And then there were further delays when they were crossing the Grand Canal, which is a huge man-made river that I covered in episode 26. These delays, especially the delay in crossing the Grand Canal, gave time for the PLA 3rd Field Army to catch up and then catch a part of the 7th Army that was still crossing the Grand Canal, and this led to that part of the 7th Army being wiped out by the PLA. On the 11th of November 1948, the remaining 7th Army became encircled by the PLA at a village 50 kilometers east of Xuzhou. The Nationalists sent the 2nd Army and the 13th Army to try and break the encirclement to rescue the 7th Army. But General Su Yu had predicted this and ordered three columns of his field army to block the Nationalist reinforcements, while the remaining columns of his field army focused on wiping out the 7th Army. The 7th Army knew at this point that reinforcements were never going to come, and that they were all alone in fighting the communists, but they didn't give up without a fight. They held off the communist army for 16 days, and managed to inflict around 49,000 communist casualties. But at the end of the day, the 7th Army was all alone, and with no reinforcements coming to break the encirclement, the 7th Army was eventually overwhelmed on the 22nd of November 1948, and their commander, Huang Baitao, committed suicide. The loss of the Nationalist 7th Army meant that the Nationalist presence east of Xuzhou was gone. We all know that to the north of Xuzhou, the communists had already occupied those territories. So that left the west and the south. The west and the south of Xuzhou had three main nationalist armies there. The 6th and 8th army from Bengbu, and then also the 12th army who joined the battle as reinforcements from the Henan province in central China. So new orders came for these three armies to take a place called Su Xian, presently the city of Suzhou, spelt S-U-Z-H-O-U. And this city, Su Xian, was in between Xuzhou and Bengbu. So, Xuzhou is the main city, and then directly to the south is the city of Bengbu. So it's like Xuzhou north, Bengbu south, and then in between is Su Xian. So, it was important for the nationalists to capture Su Xian, because then they can consolidate a supply line between Xuzhou and Bengbu. So, all three of these armies, the 6th Army, the 8th Army, and the 12th Army, moved towards Su Xian and Xuzhou. But the 6th and 8th Armies moved very, very slowly and cautiously, because they were scared about being attacked and encircled by communist forces. On the other hand, the 12th Army moved at a really quick pace, but the problem of that meant that their army stuck out like a sore thumb, way ahead of the other two armies which meant they were exposed and became an easy target. The 12th Army then became the Communists' next target. So on the 25th of November 1948, the PLA 
Second Field Army, led under Liu Bocheng and Deng Xiaoping, pinned down the 12th Army and surrounded them at a village southwest of Su Xian called Shuang Dui Ji, spelled S H U A N G D U I J I. The commander of the Nationalist Twelfth Army, Huang Wei, Huang Wei spelt H U A N G W E I, attempted to break out of this encirclement, and one of his officers volunteered to lead his army, the 110th Division, to break out first. Unfortunately for Huang Wei, this officer that volunteered was secretly a Communist Party member, and when he led his army, the 110th Division, to the Communist lines. Him and his army immediately defected over to the communists, and so when the other nationalist divisions followed the 110th division to break out, they didn't know about this. They didn't know about the defection, and they were ambushed by the communists, which forced them to retreat. Huang Wei had no choice then but to bunker down with his remaining forces and wait for reinforcements. But would these reinforcements ever arrive? With the Twelfth Army completely surrounded by the PLA Second Field Army, Jiang Jieshi ordered Du Yuming in Xuzhou to rescue the Twelfth Army. The Nationalist forces in Xuzhou at the time were the Second, the Thirteenth, and the Sixteenth Army. At this stage, you're probably wondering what happened to Liu Zhi. Well, Du Yuming kind of became the de facto commander, and Liu Zhi. Was actually airlifted out of Xuzhou and left the battlefield. Du Yuming's plan to rescue the Twelfth Army was to essentially first retreat these three armies that he had out of Xuzhou, which meant they'd have to abandon the city. Then first head west of Xuzhou and then south and cross the Huai River. Then they would set up a defensive line using the Huai River. As a natural barrier, and then from there they could launch a proactive attack on the PLA Second Field Army to rescue the Twelfth Army. Du Yuming's plan was to consolidate his own defensive position first, and then attack the PLA Second Field Army. And then obviously Huang Wei, the Twelfth Army, could attack from inside the encirclement and sort of, and then in a sense the PLA will be attacked from both sides. And the communists, especially Su Yu, realized the danger of that. Because if you had two armies attacking one army at the same time, that would have been very dangerous. So there had been speculation in the communist camp that the nationalists weren't going to retreat west, like what Du Yuming wanted to do. They thought they were going to retreat southeast rather than west. But Su Yu had correctly predicted that the nationalists would go west, and ordered his PLA Third Field Army to pursue the nationalists before they could launch any attack on the Second Field Army. Su Yu knew that they had to catch the nationalists under Du Yuming at all costs. If they didn't, it would put a lot of pressure on the Second Field Army. And then, just as Su Yu was worried about whether their army would be able to catch up to the nationalists, it seemed as if the heavens had heard him, because as Du Yuming and his army were getting away from the communists' clutches, he received a handwritten letter from Jiang Jieshi. In the letter, Jiang Jieshi essentially told Du Yuming to turn back from his original plan and head east to rescue the Twelfth Army. Du Yuming knew that this would send them straight into the pouch of the pursuing Third Field Army. Du Yuming sighed. He was like,、oh, "It's all over." Jiang Jieshi sent me and three hundred thousand of his troops straight to the grave, but he listened to his leader's advice. Changed their course of retreat, and guess what? The PLA Third Field Army caught up with them and encircled the three nationalist armies, the Second, the Thirteenth, and the Sixteenth Army, at a village ninety kilometers southwest of Xuzhou on the fourth of December, nineteen forty-eight. For the entire week after they were encircled, the nationalists attempted to break out of the encirclement, but they were beaten back by the communists every time. In this process, the Nationalist Sixteenth Army was completely annihilated by the communists trying to break out. Only their general Sun Yuanliang escaped with a small number of people. 
Meanwhile, the PLA's second army, knowing that time was of the essence, decided to launch a final assault on the 12th Army on the 15th of December 1948, and wiped out the Nationalist 12th Army. In that process, they captured the Nationalist commander, Huang Wei. The annihilation of the 12th Army, that was a huge punch in the gut for Du Yuming and the remaining Nationalist armies that were surrounded by Su Yu's 3rd Field Army. And remember, this is December. December in China is winter, and it was beginning to get cold. And then really cold. And then really, really, really cold. And for almost a month during their encirclement, the Nationalist soldiers, surrounded and trapped, suffered in this harsh winter. All of these soldiers were cold, hungry and tired. The Nationalist Air Force tried to airdrop supplies, but many of these supplies actually missed their mark and ended up in the hands of the communists. The communist soldiers, on the other hand, were well fed and supplied, and this was largely thanks to the large number of local civilians who came in waves and waves to give the communist soldiers these supplies. And the communist soldiers encircling the nationalist troops used that to their advantage. They would tempt the nationalist soldiers with food, with warmth and with shelter. And many nationalists would defect over to the communists simply because they just wanted something to eat and a good warm place to stay. In the end, on the 6th of January 1949, the communists launched a final offensive on the remaining nationalist troops. The second army general, Chiu Qingquan, was killed. The nationalist commander-in-chief, Du Yuming, was captured. The 13th army general, Li Mi managed to escape. And if you checked out my latest Instagram post about the, um, you know, the Thai village that was founded by the nationalist troops, well, they were originally under the command of Li Mi. So yeah, check that out. It wasn't a podcast episode. It was just some historical content that I wanted to share with you guys. The only two intact nationalist armies, the nationalist 6th and 8th armies, remember those two armies that were scared as hell of the communists, they barely even fought the communists, and they were the only two armies that survived the campaign for the nationalists. They retreated south of the Huai River. And as a result, the Huai Hai campaign came to an end. The Huai Hai campaign was one of the bloodiest of the three major campaigns fought by both sides in 1948 and 1949. The Nationalists, remember, came into this fight with 800,000 troops and ended up losing 550,000 of them after the campaign. This number includes not just the soldiers killed, but also includes the soldiers captured and those that defected to the Communist side. The Communists came into this fight with only 600,000 troops and lost around 130,000 troops, which was the highest loss for the Communists in all three of the campaigns. But what a lot of people don't say is that even though the communists had less troops than the nationalists, they actually had a lot more reserves. Including the 600,000 troops that they had, they had 500,000 reserve troops from local militia groups. And then adding to that, they also had around 5 million civilians spread across the central and east China countryside that were helping the communists. And they were the ones who kept the army well supplied. The Huai Hai campaign, on the other hand, was a big loss for the nationalists, because most of the soldiers who fought in this battle were the soldiers that were the most loyal to Jiang Jie Shi. And also, with this defeat, that meant that there was nothing in between the communist armies and the nationalist headquarters of Nanjing left. Remember, the Xuzhou Bengbu area was a gateway. That was now gone. Nanjing and the rest of southern China was exposed to the communists. Now let's just go through a few reasons why the nationalists lost. One of the big reasons why they lost this war was because they were so insistent on defending Xuzhou. But the issue of that was Xuzhou was geographically isolated from many of the other nationalist bases. To give you some examples, the closest airport besides the airport in Xuzhou was actually all the way down south in Nanjing, which meant that if they wanted to airdrop supplies, 
it'd take them ages to get there. And the only land supply line to Xuzhou was via a singular railway line down south to the city of Bengbu. If this line was cut, then all of the nationalist armies around Xuzhou would be cut from supplies and they'd be screwed. A better strategy then for the nationalists would have been to just retreat south altogether, down south of the Huai River, where the river could act as a natural barrier from the communists. But politically, this was never going to work for Jiang Jieshi. Surrendering Xuzhou and the surrounding areas was just not an option, because he believed that if he surrendered Xuzhou and all the surrounding areas, this would be a signal to the people that there was no confidence from the nationalists to defeat the communists. Another reason for the loss was that the nationalists had some leadership failures. You see, the nationalist government was wrought with infighting and factionalism, and that affected the cooperation of the nationalist armies fighting on the ground. And it wasn't like Jiang Jieshi didn't know that. He knew that there was all this infighting and factionalism. So to solve this problem, he believed the best solution was just to control everything himself and to hold ultimate power of the commanding forces on the ground. But then there was a problem of that as well, because if he held ultimate power, well, Jiang Jieshi wasn't physically at the battlefield. So he wouldn't have that much of a clue of what was going on compared to the people who were actually there, right? And it was frustrating then, because if you were a field commander, you know, fighting at the battlefield, any decision that you had to make actually had to get his approval first, Jiang Jieshi's approval. And that would create delays because you had a you had an extra layer of basically an approval process you had to go through. And these delays would cause a loss of valuable time, which gave the communists an advantage. And the last reason why I think the nationalists lost was because the communists, they were simply too good in this campaign. And a big reason why the communists won was because they had the commoners on their side. In my opinion, the biggest mistake of the nationalists was their failure to project their power onto the vast Chinese countryside. You see, their strategy after World War II ended in 1945 was to take control of all the urban centres, all the cities. But what they failed to recognise was, at the time, the majority of the Chinese population were in the rural areas, in the countryside, and guess who controlled the countryside? The communists. And the communists weren't stupid. They already knew they had the advantage of controlling the countryside and all its people. So then they ensured that they treated the commoners well. And so in return, by treating the commoners well, that meant they would help the communists in return. And that was what happened. And the local people were invaluable to the communists. Local knowledge of the area, supplies from all the villages, as well as intel of the nationalist movements, you know, these were all provided in part and in full by the local people. So this gave an edge to the communists, who meant they were well supported and they never really needed to worry about protecting their supply lines, unlike the nationalists, because they knew their supply lines were everywhere. So yeah, that ends the episode of the second of the three major campaigns of the Civil War, the Huaihai Campaign. I hope you all enjoyed today's content. Next week, we're going to wrap up with the third and final major campaign of the Chinese Civil War, the Pingjing Campaign. So please stick around for that one. That one's really interesting as well. And also, to all your listeners, don't forget to subscribe to my podcast and follow my Instagram at Bamboo History Podcast. If you've got any feedback, general comments, topic suggestions, or whatnot, please contact me. You can either DM me on my Instagram or email me. Those details will be in the description box below. All right now, it's time for me to go. Thanks everyone for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, and I'll see you for part three next week on the Bamboo History Podcast. Bye for now.